Good evening and welcome to the third Liberty News Google Hangout. And that's Jimmy Bice's empty chair. Let me go ahead and switch the camera over to me. I'm Dwayne Lester, editor of LibertyNews.com, CampaignTrailReport.com. And uh, joining me for tonight's pre-debate hangout is, is, my <laughs> is uh, John Hawkins from Right Wing News, Linkiest, and I don't know how many other sites you have going on now. You got Pick a Quote. What else you got going on, John? Pick a Quote I just killed today, so thanks for bringing up bad memories, Dwayne. Sorry about that. Let's start over from the beginning. <laughs> uh, anyway, Jimmy Bice just sat down. He is back with us. I believe he was just up pimp slapping whoever scheduled the last debate for Tuesday night. I was. Uh, the Romney. Uh, the Romney campaign has been thoroughly chastised. And we are expecting at any moment now, uh, author. Kurt Schlichter of Breitbart fame and Twitter fame, and Mr. Smith Media himself, Ben Howe. They've both been sent uh, tweets directing them here, and hopefully they'll be joining us soon. So tonight is a uh, the last of three debates, and the whole focus tonight is on foreign policy. One would hope, John, that this is an easy win for Mitt Romney, but he kind of blew it last time, didn't he? Oh, I don't think so. I think he did fine. It's just that Barack Obama managed to have his eyes open in the second debate, and he managed to talk back in the second debate and did a little better, but it didn't slow down Mitt Romney's momentum at all, so I think Mitt's doing fine. I expect him to do fine tonight. After all, what has Barack Obama got to talk about? Uh, I mean, you can't kill Osama bin Laden again. <laughs> no. I mean, what? oh, I'm going to do just as well the second term as I did the first term. Well, you can't kill him a second time, so that's your pretty much one accomplishment on the foreign policy front. I guess he could win another Nobel Peace Prize. That would be nice. I don't know what he won the first one for, so you never know. They could conceivably give it to him again. Jimmy may get a Nobel Peace Prize for something he says tonight, the way it's going. So, Nice work, Jimmy. Hey, thanks. Um, I was going to suggest that the one way Barack Obama could kill Osama bin Laden again uh, is to use his heretofore unused Trump card, Zombies. Good call. Good call. Let me ask you this, Jimmy. How many? How, how can uh, Mitt Romney hit Obama best in foreign policy? You know, I think I didn't actually because I was doing my my podcast last week. I didn't get to watch the debate. I listened to it, and it was interesting. You know, the one thing that really stuck out is when they when they started talking about. Remember, they started talking about Libya and Candice Crowley's famous interruption, right? That knocked, if you go back and listen to that, that knocked Mitt completely off his game. He literally, he lost all his focus, and what could have been a big punch was a small punch, because I think Mitt was going back to say, no, 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 I know what the transcript said, but he didn't quite have it. I think what you're going to find is that Mitt is going to be, he's going to have some of the little details tucked away in his memory, in case Bob Schieffer does the same thing. What Mint needs to do is just, I mean, you know, in, in sports terms, he needs to stay up on the balls of his feet and expect that something like that can happen. If he gets interrupted, jump back into it. Keep on going. Don't don't rock back. Don't don't get back on your heels. Stay on the balls of your feet and stay on them. And if if you have to take on she for two, take on she for two. Do what you need to do. But I mean, look, John John's point's perfect. Um. This is a and it, this is a debate between two guys who have no foreign policy experience. So, um, you know, in that sense, the playing field is even. The president doesn't have any real foreign policy triumphs. It sure he killed Osama bin Laden. Well, great, but when you really look at that, and I'm, I don't say this in, in a partisan sense, killing Osama bin Laden is. It's a die roll on any given day. You know you have people out looking for him. We've had people out looking for him since George Bush. At some point, we're going to find him. It's only a matter of who's sitting in the White House when that happens. If it happens a year and a half later, it could be Mitt Romney. It happened to be Barack Obama. He did what any president would do. That's all he's got. I think Mitt, you know, it's just two inexperienced guys, and I think Mitt needs to play that up. You know what, I, I think that if, if, and we can expect, 
uh, Obama to talk about uh, getting bin Laden. And personally, I mean, I, I'd love to know what you guys think about this, but as soon as he brought that up, as soon as he started making that kind of the cornerstone of his foreign policy, because like Jimmy said, he doesn't have a whole lot of uh, wins. As soon as he starts bringing that up, if I were Mitt Romney, I would start asking who wouldn't make that call? Who wouldn't, if, if he knew where he was, make that call? And why was it such a hard decision for you in the first place? John, what do you think? Yeah, it's, it's not much of a gutsy call if everybody would do it. In fact, the only people who would probably think it is actually a gutsy call would be someone like Richard Gere or, or Janine Garofalo. To everybody else in America, it's the easiest call in the world. Hey, we've got a bunch of SEALs. We know where Barack, where, uh, I was going to say Barack Obama, where Osama bin Laden is. Can we kill him? And you say, yes, everybody would. This debate's going to be interesting for a number of reasons because you have all these different dynamics going on. One of them is the American public generally assumes Democrats are incompetent at foreign policy and Republicans are in are good at it. So they tend to discount anything that Democrats do and give Republicans a, a bonus. It's just part of something that's baked in the cake. On the other hand, when you look at it, uh, this hasn't been a, an election centered around foreign policy. That might have been the case in, say, 2004 or 2008. Not so much this time around. So you may see them trying to shift it back to domestic policy when they can. The other thing that comes into play is that it's going to be difficult for Obama to hammer Mitt Romney a lot. He can say things, but Mitt doesn't really have a foreign policy record. He can say, well, I don't think Mitt would do well at this. I don't think Mitt can do well at that. Mitt can point out lots of blunders and mistakes that Obama's made. And that's one of the problems Obama's had all along is he does have a record now. He's trying to run as if he's a challenger, but he's an incumbent with a pretty terrible record. That extends through foreign policy. I think you're going to see Mitt hit him, for example, on China. That's an area where he's been talking a lot about trade and evening the gap there. That's trying to reach out to Michigan, to Ohio, to Pennsylvania and say, we're going to take on that trade deficit in the way that Barack Obama hasn't. You're going to see him hit him on Libya because they're in the middle of that scandal. And it is a scandal. Barack Obama, a couple of weeks after they knew it was a terrorist attack, he was still out there blaming a filmmaker. It's ridiculous. You're going to see him, uh, I think, go after him on, on a lot of different things. And I think you're going to see him hammer him hard. I think Barack Obama's going to fire back. I expect it to be more of an even battle, and but I think as long as Mitt Romney doesn't make any big gaffes, I think his momentum will continue, and I think you're going to see the, the things continue to go in his direction, which is good. I mean, we're late in the election. It's roughly tied, or Mitt's maybe a little bit ahead, and he has the momentum. That is a great, great place to be for a challenger. When I was reading about the uh, Benghazi attacks today, there was <clears throat> something in the news today regarding the CIA and his intel briefings. And correct me if I'm wrong, but what I read, and I think it was at the Wall Street Journal, they were saying that President Obama was still getting intel briefings that said it was re related to a protest like a couple of weeks later. Is that correct? Or is that, am I, am I wrong there? Did you guys read that? I didn't read that. Uh, I, in fact, I've been told that he knew within 24 hours that it was a terrorist attack, that in fact, if you listen to the administration's early briefings, that they, were, they weren't coming out quite and saying it was a terrorist attack, but they got less accurate as time went on as they moved away from the idea that it was a terrorist attack towards the idea that it was a protest, even as the facts that they must have been getting were saying exactly the opposite. So I I'm not hearing that he was under the impression, maybe that spin or something they're putting out, but everything I've heard seems to indicate that within 24 hours or so, they knew this was a terrorist attack and kept pushing the idea that it was related to this film. You know, I, I, you're right. The, the longer it went on, the, the more jumbled it got. And last debate, President Obama wanted us to think that within 24 hours, he was in the Rose Garden calling it a terrorist attack. But then his subordinates are out for the next 14 days saying that it was related to a protest that the president never mentioned. And it is one giant mess. And I think that's something really, that alone, the handling of, of this thing, could be something that Romney could use uh, very decisively. Jimmy, what do you think? Uh, two things. Number one, I think when you go back and look, you're going to see that there were three different 
three different stories coming out of the administration. The White House had its own story about what happened. The State Department had its own story. And then the CIA and the intelligence organizations had their own story. And the real problems for the administration is that those three stories weren't the same story. They were all completely different, and sometimes they were stepping on each other. You'd have intelligence people come out and say, well, it was a terrorist attack. But then you'd have people from the State Department come out and say, well, we think it was a terrorist attack, and we're still getting information. And then you'd have the White House come out and say, um, no, we're not prepared to say it's anything. We're doing a complete investigation. And then the FBI would come out and say, well, we don't have any people in Libya yet. So there was this thing coming out from all over the place. I'll tell you where I want to see Mitt really go after the president on Libya. You guys remember when this whole thing started? And I don't mean the attack on Benghazi. I mean our involvement in Libya, period. Right. The president announced it when he was out of the country. He was in Peru. He announced that we were going to be involved there. And he stayed out of the country. And when Congress communicated to him that he needed to come tell them what he was doing, he basically gave them the finger. Everything that's going on in Libya right now is 100% on Barack Obama. Not on the Congress, not on the State Department, not on the military, it's on the President. Because he went in without asking, without asking Congress, without consulting the Congress, without ever explaining what it is he wanted to do. We learned within, I think, a couple days that um, the State Department was still trying to figure out who all the players were. We didn't even know who the dominant rebels were. We had no idea. We were just there. And even while we were there, the president still hasn't told us what exactly he wanted to do there. Set up a stable government? If so, who? Um just keep things keep things uh, stabilized for a little while. We pull out. If so, when? He's told us nothing from the very beginning. This is all on him. And I think Mitt Romney can make the point, maybe a little less directly than, than I am, that the deaths of those four Americans, including our ambassador, are directly are directly Barack Obama is responsible. For Not in a he's the president, he's responsible sort of way, but in the He's the only guy who knew everything that was going on. He gave the order. He did it himself unilaterally. This is on him. John, what do you make of that? Well, first of all, I never, ever, ever wanted to put American troops on the ground in Libya. I didn't want our planes in the air. If, you wanted, if we wanted to generally support the Libyan people and overthrowing Gaddafi, that was fine, but I was always supposed to going in there and bombing. I didn't like the idea that uh, a decade after 9-11, we're teaming up with al-Qaeda to overthrow the one dictator who was cooperating with us in the war on terror. I don't think it sends much of a good message. Gaddafi was an awful guy, but I'm not sure the people who are in charge of that country today are any better. I'd say the same thing about Egypt, where we've got a, uh, a guy in charge who's, you know, they're talking about destroying the Jews, and he's mouthing amen under his breath. These are not good people. These are not our friends. We're very foolish to think they are our friends. I don't know that we have a, a, a democracy in either country. We'll know that when there's a democracy, when you see these guys go out of power after an election. Until then, we've got dictators in there, as far as I'm concerned, until we see something otherwise. And I also think in Libya, we shouldn't have been in there. He should have gone to Congress first. I don't understand why. And there's still been no good explanation for why we didn't have security in there. I'm baffled as to why we would not have pretty good security in Libya. We know it's an unstable country. We know al-Qaeda is in the area. They asked for security. They didn't get it. I have yet to hear any sort of explanation for why they didn't have security. Barack Obama's never explained it. The State Department's never explained it. Nobody has ever said, gee, here's why we didn't have Marines there to keep our guys from getting killed. And that's something, again, I think Mitt Romney could press on. But like with his domestic policy, there are a multitude of targets, of, of uh, high-impact targets that Mitt Romney can hit. I'm sure he is ready to hit him on all these different things, and he should. Barack Obama has a confused, muddled foreign policy. There's no rhyme or reason to it. There's no logic to it. It's him sitting down when he's on vacation or playing golf and saying, gee, I think it'd be a great idea to invade Libya. Psh, 
well, maybe you should think that through a little more. Now, <clears throat> there is one thing that uh, I, I want to I touch on, but here in a second. If, if you remember right, when this all happened in Libya, uh, Hillary Clinton actually came out and said something to the effect of it. It, it may be these words exactly. How could this happen? And I remember when I read that, I thought, how could this not happen? And I went back and, and found an article that I wrote at All American Blogger when we went back into when we went into Libya the first time. And there was an article, I think, in the Daily Mail. They were talking about the fact that the people that were uh, part of the rebellion in Libya were actually people that had been released from U.S. custody in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And these were people who were months prior to this, shooting and trying to kill American forces in both of those countries, and now they're in Libya trying to overthrow Gaddafi, and we're helping them. And when she said, how could this happen, I thought, how could this not happen? These are the same people who months prior were trying to kill us, and you're surprised that they tried to kill us in Libya? I mean, how inept is this? The, the, and I think that's something that if Mitt Romney went back, that would be a good good point. But John, you said something that it, it, it's like he's, he, his foreign policy is that he's just throwing darts at a dartboard, you know, to, you know, just what are we going to do today? And I just two nights ago sat down with some friends and watched 2016 for the first time. And I'm kind of curious if either one of you have seen it and is there anything to this anti-colonialism that Dinesh D'Souza is talking about in the application of his foreign policy against, you know, especially regarding countries like Libya, Israel, uh, Iran. Is there this anti-colonialism, or is D'Souza just uh, off base? Jimmy, what do you think? Have you seen it, and what do you think? No, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the movie. Um, I've, I've heard the theory a couple times before, and I think it's plausible. I personally don't think it's, I don't think it's right. Quite, I don't think it's quite right. I think it goes maybe a little farther than it needs to, Um I don't think it's bad. It may end up being right, and I could be wrong about it. What I think Barack Obama spent his entire life essentially surrounded by pretty bog-standard progressives, 60s radicals, old progressive holdouts, academics, Chicago politicians, pretty much what you've seen out of him as president, what you saw out of him for the uh, 35 minutes he was a United States senator, before he started running for president, um, what what we've seen out of him is pretty much just the standard boilerplate left wing stuff, and I don't know that it's it could be an anti colonial thing, or it could just be the whole thing that um, America is an oppressor and an, an American empire is bad, and uh, Israel kills Palestinians. And uh, America shouldn't be involved in Africa, uh, but if they are, they should be oppressing people. They should be helping people in kind of a vague, gauzy, healthy way. Um, that's, I think, really, I don't think the president thinks through stuff very much. I think he just says, look, this is what I was taught. It seems right to me. I haven't had anyone around contradict me. It must be right. Let's do it. John, what do you think? I have not seen 2016 yet. As to Barack Obama, just looking at the way he behaves, I mean, keep in mind, this is a guy who didn't spend his entire childhood in the United States. He grew up outside of our country. He was exposed to some pretty strange stuff when he's a kid, eating dogs to gain powers from it, that sort of stuff. And that marinates in your head as you're a kid. He went he spent 20 years going to Jeremiah Wright's anti-American church. And liberalism, he's more of that, I think, that Chomsky and America's not the good guy school. That's why he's bowing when he goes overseas. That's why he, he doesn't start with the thought process that America's the good guy. He doesn't start with it. He starts with the idea that America has something to apologize for. And it guides his foreign policy. A lot of times, and this is something you've heard Ann Coulter say many times, you know, liberals are not interested in foreign policy that advances America's interests. In fact, they get really interested in doing something when there's no obvious way that our country benefits. I think you see that in Libya. We have no reason to be involved in Libya, so we're there. 
Now we've got troops in Jordan, supposedly, to help contain any spillover from Syria. I don't know why we're there. Yeah. So it's a mentality that he gets into, and it's it's not one that I think starts the way most Americans do, which is what's in America's best interests. I don't think that is the, the core, the center block of his thought process on foreign policy, and it shows he comes from another place on it, whether that's anti-colonialism or something else. I don't know, but it's not a good way to do foreign policy. We've talked a lot about Syria, and, and or not Syria, but uh, Libya, and there, there are other places where Obama has had a serious impact, and I think one of those we need to talk about is, is in regard to Russia. How big is that open mic gap of his going to be tonight, where he said he'd be giving Russia flexibility? Jimmy? I think in a debate, it depends on what, it really, it depends on what Mitt Romney does with it. Because it's one of those things that the president can, at least for purposes of the debate, kind of explain away. When the president can say, well, clearly I can devote all my time to governing the country, whereas with the system that we have, I have to actually uh, spend time... Um, also running for re-election, and in my second term, I'll be able to devote all my time not out on the campaign trail, but being here in the Oval Office and governing America. And he can kind of give that, and, and, and Bob Schieffer, Bob Schieffer will have a little gasm, and it'll all be good. Everybody will be happy. If Mike right, well, really wants to make all, hate with it, that's don't, all don't, don't, don't hold that mental image in your head. Don't do it. Thanks, thanks for joining us, Ben. That's all the time we have. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be just like last week. Hold on. Ben uh, Howe is here now, Mr. Smith Media. Thanks for joining us. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were just discussing how big of an... Oh, and the pirate hat is out. <laughs> we were just discussing how big of an impact the gaffe on flexibility would have, would be in tonight's, uh, in, in tonight's debate. Oh. Is that something you think Romney can capitalize on and how? I mean, he could. I just don't think that he will. I'm, I I think he's going to be so prepped and so coached on uh, Libya and on uh, the Middle East situation. I'm I'm betting his people told him, you know, don't bring this up because uh, most people don't even know about it. Focus on Libya and let's carry that all the way to election day. But I wish he would bring it up because it says a lot about how Obama views um, his obligations as president. John, what do you think? Is this something that, because personally, I would love for Romney to get in there and really explain what he meant. Is that something he can do effectively tonight? Well, Mitt, uh, for whatever his flaws may be, is a very prepared debater. He will have that in the arsenal. If the time and opportunity comes up, he'll bring that up. And he's got a lot of things to hit on, and it, it may play into his overall theme, I think, which you've heard him touch on in the other two debates, which is that Barack Obama's foreign policies in tatters. Uh, Egypt's a mess. Libya's a mess. They don't love us in the Middle East. We're not looking over at Li what's going on in Libya and Egypt is not exactly encouraging. It's nothing that I look at and get excited. Afghanistan's not going so well. So you look at what's going on in the Middle East, and I don't think it's any better than what was going on when George Bush was there. I don't see anything that makes me go, wow, this is something we should be proud of that's going on in the Middle East. In fact, I think it's pretty dangerous and scary. You've got Egypt talking about nuclear weapons now. The people there want them. They're becoming increasingly hostile to Israel. Basically, they, they're rioting. On our uh, at our embassy, and the you know, the the uh, guy who's running the country is giving the thumbs up to it. Our people are dying in Libya. You look at all this stuff, and it it says a little something. It says that Barack Obama, his foreign policy is not coherent, and it's not working. And I think Mitt's going to lay into all that and sort of expand on that theme. And I think he'll hit it there too. Russia's not working with us. We we supposedly at the start of the term. We took Hillary out there with the reset button, and it actually said overcharge, which was really embarrassing. So we do that. Russia has been working against us. They've been helping Iran build nuclear weapons. They've been helping the dictator in Syria. These are not good guys, but Barack Obama's been working with them, and he's going to be flexible. What is he going to be flexible on? Letting them give more uh, nuclear material to Iran? Letting them uh, help kill more people in Syria? What is he actually looking to cooperate with him on? So 
I think he's going to hammer it, hammer it home, and I think he's going to do a lot of damage with that tonight, and we'll see how it plays out. Ben, aside from – go ahead, Jimmy. You know, Dwayne, there's a, an interesting thing, girls. I, I don't know that we'll have enough time for it, but you look at what the administration has done, not necessarily to our putative enemies – the, that, and that's one thing. We can look at the Muslim Brotherhood, the Taliban, Vladimir Putin. Look what he's done to our friends. Can you recall a year, one year, in which three of our closest allies, the leaders, not just kind of rumblings from inside the country, the prime ministers of Great Britain, Poland, and Israel, publicly called out our president on how he treated them. I can't you know, it, it may have happened at some point, but I can't imagine. I don't remember a year when three of our friends gave us the diplomatic version of a bawling out. I can't remember when that happened. And we can go back to um, our friends in Colombia who were begging the White House to do something with a free trade agreement, and he struck them out because that's what Nancy Pelosi wanted. Um, our State Department meddled in Honduras, another country that would be our ally in an area of the country where we need some real honest-to-God friends. We need some real close friends in Central America, and Honduras is willing, except we managed to stick our big feet in the middle of their election when we didn't have to. These are not just, not just our enemies, but our friends and the people who want to be our friends we're giving them the back of our hand. And I think that's something else that Mitt Romney could bring to the front is to say, look, if you, you know, don't even look at our enemies, look at the people who are our friends or want to be our friends, and look at how he treats them. That's just, just adding on to what Jimmy said real quick, I think it just goes into what you've seen from Barack Obama. This is a very small, trivial man who's very amateurish, who's filling a very big, important job that requires someone who's very professional. He doesn't have time for this detail stuff. He's not qualified to do it. Anything that doesn't feature him giving a speech is over his head. He doesn't think strategically about this stuff. He's not capable of handling it because they don't think it through. They don't have the professionalism and the competency to look at these kind of issues and plan them out ahead. They're just fly by the seat of their pants, and if everything goes badly, he'll give a speech and talk about how wonderful he is, and everybody will forgive him because that's what's worked throughout the rest of his career. And like Jimmy says, he's, he's screwed up things in Colombia and Honduras all over the world. With Britain, with Israel, it goes on and on. And it's just another case. This is, this is not an adult. You know, Mitt Romney is running as an adult to run the White House. Barack Obama is like a little child. He's not up to the task of running the White House. Ben, anything to add? Well, Obama killed uh, uh, Osama bin Laden. That is true. So, so game, game over. over. <laughs> Let me ask you this. In my opinion, this is a foreign policy issue as much as it is a, a domestic issue. Uh, does Romney bring Fast and Furious into this debate? And should it? Well, it didn't work out very well last time. Um, I mean, that was the moderator's fault. But I can't imagine that it wouldn't come up I mean, it is foreign policy. I know that they're, you know, our neighbors to the south and, and whatever, but it seems like it's it falls in the uh, category of foreign policy, and it's a scandal, and it's a cover-up, and it's all the bad things uh, that you would expect to be brought up in a debate like this. It really just depends on Schieffer, I guess. I mean, I think Romney's going to wait for the signal uh, and follow Schieffer's lead on that particular one just because it was brought up last time and he was shot down. Um but I'm hoping that uh, uh, he'll try to sneak it in there if, if, if there's any trouble again. Because when did he sneak it in on last time? He snuck it in on a... Uh, uh, it was a question the, about guns, so it was, it was a question it was about target. target. Right. And then, uh, uh, Cra uh, what's her name? Crowley cut him off uh, and then let Obama go off on education for a few minutes. But um, I think that that was... Uh, there, there were a few things that happened in the last debate, specifically about foreign policy, that I'm betting they're a little bit gun-shy on right now, and their point of view is going to be uh, there's plenty to cover, there's plenty of ground to cover, aside from 
the things that were already brought up in the last debate. So let's bring up things people haven't heard, and let's delve a little deeper into Libya. Uh, and there's even been, of course, news that continues to break on Libya. So um, I think that's going to be the big focus for Romney. Um, I do think that there is a broader foreign policy argument to make, like John was saying, that uh, Romney should be trying to take on. He's long before Libya came around, we were already talking about the apology tour. We were talking about how bad Egypt had gone. We were talking about the bad decisions he'd made in Afghanistan. He didn't listen to his generals. He sent in less troops than they recommended. Now they're uh, um, not sending enough people uh, in to support the ones who are still there, which Romney touched on in the last debate. And um, there's at least a little bit of loss of control that's been happening in Iraq. Of course, Iran I mean, long before Libya happened, if they had had the foreign policy debate, Obama would have already been in a lot of trouble. Libya should just be, you know, the culmination of all this disaster that's been happening for years. But he's uh, way out of his league, and it's so apparent. And I think he brought Hillary on as a way to give himself, I know this is a buzzword, but some gravitas uh, to the ticket in terms of, well, not to the ticket, to the administration in terms of... Uh, um, some credentials. And now she's showing that she's just as naive and stupid when it comes to this and completely screwed up as Secretary of State. So um, he's going to have a tough time. I do think that there's at least the possibility that whether or not he makes it sound like it's very, um, you know, he'll use that, that phrase, it's under investigation, we're looking into it, etc. In some way or another, I expect him to throw a few people under the bus, the intelligence community, the uh, State Department. Um, and, you know, which basically means Hillary Clinton. He'll do it by way of saying things like, you know, these are the things that we were told at the time, and so we were reacting to what the intelligence uh, community was telling us. And that sounds all reasonable. Really what he's saying is the intelligence community screwed up, and it's not his fault. So I expect that to be his answer to a lot of those questions. I'm curious about... The, the war in Afghanistan and how much that will be brought up. I read something today um, where it was a UN guy. He was a, uh, I, don't, I can't remember the official UN title, but he actually said that if Mitt Romney is reelected, uh, we will actually be creating more terrorists because Mitt Romney will be bring back waterboarding, and that will cause people to turn against us far more, far more than you know under Barack Obama, because Barack Obama doesn't. Uh, waterboard and uh, when I wrote about this this morning I said yes but he does kill a lot of civilians with drone attacks mm -hmm. so I mean when you think about things uh, you see the UN clearly this guy is shilling for Obama mm -hmm. but how much is it going I, I, I'm curious how much the drone war will play into this because he's going into Pakistan and he's, he's blowing stuff up all over the place and he, that's something he considers uh, considers a, a win for him I, um, I don't, I, yeah I don't think it's gonna I don't think it would play well for him because uh, I mean at least in my experience maybe you guys have different experience but it seems to be mostly libertarians and far left that care uh, a lot about the drone attacks and everyone else it's sort of either a non-issue or just not that important to them the ones who are upset about it are extremely upset uh, but I don't think that, that it will hit a, a broad enough audience for it to be worth it for him to bring up. I think that it's much, it, it, especially in terms of Afghanistan and, um, you know, well, really in Pakistan. You know, Pakistan's another good example. Yeah, he killed Osama bin Laden. Uh, why, didn't, why was the Pakistani government not letting us know that he was there? Why did we have to sneak in in order to take him out? Uh, what have you done since then? Have you just continued to send them all this money? Even if it's the case, and we all know it's the case, that a lot of the money that goes to these countries that are not exactly friendly to us is basically bribery to get them, you know, we'll give you a bunch of money and, and you calm down a little bit in terms of your weaponry and your actions. But even if that's the case, and even if Romney would in some ways extend that as president, it's still a great topic to bring up. Why are you still sending money to Pakistan? Why are you still sending money to these countries that are hostile to us? I think he'd score some points. Even if Obama came back and said, you would do the same thing, I don't think it would work because he's not been president yet. Obama's been the one who's actually continued to authorize it. What do you think, John? Is that something that he... 
he could do that if if Mitt Romney if if Mitt came out and said, look, I'd stop sending money to Pakistan because they they were there when they were helping. Uh, they were they knew Bin Laden was there. But more importantly, could he make a case that actually sending foreign aid at all just props up dictators and doesn't help the people? I'll do this first. Um, the uh, the uh, New York Times caucus debate. Um, has a uh, has the the broad topics for apparently they're going to be uh, six segments, and the segments broadly at least are going to be um, in no uncertain order. Uh, America's role in the world, our longest war Afghanistan, red lines Israel and Iran, two segments on the changing Middle East and the new face of terrorism, and then a segment on the rise of China and tomorrow's world. There's a so new those are so those are your those are apparently the broad topics that uh, that Schieffer has chosen. Uh, as far as foreign aid, you know, not long ago I wrote a post about this, um, which is to say I think that every dime that goes out in foreign aid ought to come with more strings attached to it than a marionette convention. Um, we are an economic power. Our soft power is considerable. And there is no reason in the world that we can't tell these world leaders, yeah, sure, we'll give you $10 billion, but there are some things you've got to do for us. F one, start liberalizing your country. And by liberalizing, we mean freedom of speech, freedom of religion, basic human rights. You don't treat women like, you know, like second citizens. You start to liberalize your economy a little bit. Um, Give people and, and and make and make our money contingent on stuff like that. Open your country up to our businesses so that the American culture. I mean, people joke about blue jeans and rock and roll, but blue jeans and rock and roll. <laughs> I, I hesitate to say this because it's semi country. Blue jeans and rock and roll freed Russia. I mean, before there was Reagan, before there was Thatcher, before there was Pope John Paul, before there was Solidarity, before in Poland and all that stuff, blue jeans and rock and roll was the water in the cracks of the Soviet Union that would freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw, and every McDonald's and every pair of Levi's blue jeans and every godforsaken Nickelback and Justin Bieber album that we can send into the middle. Okay, maybe not Nickelback and yeah, Justin Bieber. Uh, yeah, Justin Bieber, I'm going to have to... Maybe, I'm gonna take but, issue with that. that could, but every every little bit of our culture that we can share with them is a, another thing in common that they have with us, and that they don't have with the people who want to keep them in the sixth century. Mm -hmm. So let's you start, have a lot more faith in. Uh, I think you you have more faith in uh, the ability for the people there to change than I do. I have to say, I mean, I I, I feel like they have rejected Westernization for so long. I, I can't imagine what's going to finally get them to change. But, hey, if we don't lose anything by, by uh, applying the strings that you're talking about. We don't lose anything by saying these are, these are what we require of you to get money. Because the worst case scenario is they say no, and then we don't send them the money. Let me ask, let me ask John Hawkins a question here. Can Mitt Romney make some inroads by saying he would not give foreign aid to, terror, to countries like Pakistan and he would put uh, strings, like like Jimmy said. Well, for one thing, I've been long advocating putting a lot more strings on the money we give out. I think it is ridiculous that we give money to these countries, sometimes billions of dollars, and basically say, all right, we're going to ask almost nothing of you. Like, for example, uh, in, in Egypt, before Mubarak was gone, we would be giving them this enormous sum of money, and part of that, let's be honest, is bribe money not to uh, break their peace treaty with Israel. But their press, which was government controlled, would be nothing but anti American rants. And it's like, why are we giving you all this money when you're going to use the government controlled press to tell your people how evil we are? And I do think we should have a lot more strings. I think you will see Mitt touch on that area. Um, I don't think he can afford to come out and say we're not going to give out any more foreign aid. People get very upset about foreign aid, and they have reason to be upset, but there's also a lot of benefit to it. It's a lot cheaper than going to war. It's a lot cheaper than uh, you know uh, some of the other things we might have to do. We give a little bit of money here, and it keeps things under control, but we also have a right to say if we're going to give you our money, 
taxpayer money, sometimes money we're going to have to borrow from China to give to you. My God, you better be doing a lot of things right for us. You better be doing a lot of things that are going to make us happy. That's why we're giving you the money. We're not giving you the money as an act of charity. We're giving you the money because we want something in return. It needs to be in our interest. If it's not, I don't think we should be giving the money out. So I think you might see them, for example, ask, why are we forgiving a billion dollars of debt for Egypt? I mean, these guys aren't very cooperative right now. Why are we why are we doing that? Why are we feeding all this money into Libya right now? They just yeah, we just lost people there. There I'd like to see us cut off every dime of aid to Egypt and Libya until we get a lot more favorable terms out of both countries. So I do think there's reason to bring these things up. With Pakistan, the moment we cut off aid to Pakistan will be the moment that the war in Afghanistan is over because we need their supply routes to make it work. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he could afford to cut it off entirely, but I do think you can bring it up, criticize uh, Obama on it, and say, hey, we should have a lot more strings on this money, which I think is true. I mean, it's a little, you know, it's a, it's, my position is a little cynical in that my, I'm less concerned about what Mitt's going to actually do in terms of his um, foreign aid policies once he gets into office. I'm more thinking that this is, this is a great way to score points. You know, he can, he can say, I'll, I'll address exactly who we're going to uh, give foreign aid to and what strings are going to be attached and stay very general and very vague and still score points against Obama because what he's talking about is what he may or may not do when he's in office. What Obama would be talking about is what he's already specifically done while he's in office. So it's all win for Romney and it's all lose for Obama. I definitely think he should bring it up. I hope he does. Well, along those lines, why are we spending stimulus money in Finland? Why are we spending stimulus money in China? I this guess is you can nuts. call that foreign policy, right? We're, we're, yeah, it is. I mean, we're, if we're going to borrow money from China, put it in the stimulus, and then spend it in China, mm -hmm. that's foreign policy. It makes no sense. And it is, in a sense, foreign aid. But we're, it, we're calling it stimulus, but it's actually turning into foreign aid. It makes no sense. It's insane. It's something we shouldn't be doing. I wonder if they're going to bring up tariffs and uh, monetary policy as it relates to China, because that's the thing that Obama wants to hit uh, Romney on, is China. He thinks it's naive, et cetera. Um, I wonder yeah, if that's something that's going to that. actually come up. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know something? If I, if, if, I were, if I were Romney, I'd invite that attack. I'd, I'd, I'd literally, I literally I would toss it out there and let the president bite on it, because, look, the, the, the truth is that... At least I don't say the truth is. I think Mitt Romney's right. Mm -hmm. um, China, I I am not as um, I am not as big on China. As, I'm like like I'm not Tom Friedman. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on the other side. I think China's economy is going to grow for a while, and I think China is in some real trouble. Um, and I think that real trouble is coming sooner rather than later when the Chinese people realize that what their government's been blowing at them when it comes to economic numbers is garbage. It's fantasy. Um, there aren't as many jobs in the city as they've been telling the people in the country, and the people in the country have been swarming into the cities looking for jobs that aren't there. Um, the economy can't sustain the way it's grown. They're doing it on, on, on fairy dust right now, and it can't last a whole lot longer. In fairy um, dust, though. Fairy while, dust while they're is there, that. But while they're there, we've got to, we have to deal with them. You know what I mean? Go ahead, Ben. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just talking about how the uh, the price of fairy dust has really it's, gone up over the last. It's few because years. China controls the market. They've been buying it all from everybody. <laughs> See, here's the other problem with China, and, and this is something that I, I want to toss out to you guys because it. I, when I think about the implication, it, it kind of scares me. Um, and give me a second because China has problem number one. China has a lot of unemployed young men thanks to its one-child policy, its preferences for boys, but the fact that it doesn't have jobs for them, it's got a country where there are a lot of young men who don't have work. Traditionally, what you do with young men who don't have work is you stick them in the military, which is exactly what China has been doing. China has been building up its military. Some people think it's so that the expansionist, I tend to think that it's so that it has something to do with its young men. On the other hand, China also has an economy that needs a lot of raw goods. It needs uh, minerals from um, South America and Africa. 
Well, what do you do when you have an army full of young men, no war, and um, resources in countries, in uncertain countries that you need to protect? Well, you send your young men over there to protect the supply lines. But what that means is all of a sudden you have little Chinese outposts all over Africa and in South America, and if the Chinese government doesn't go well, if things start to get a little wobbly, you just have a whole bunch of young Chinese guys out there on military outposts with no direction and guns. And not necessarily a lot of training in how not to use them. I don't... That... I'm more worried about Chinese falling, China falling apart than I am about China becoming powerful. Hi, Kurt. Am I the only one that saw Kurt Schlichter join and thought he was going to scream and his voice leave Mitt alone? <laughs> <laughs> Not Chris. Klein. Leave him alone. <laughs> Kurt, what were you work. expecting tonight? We've, we've, we've covered uh, so much tonight, but I am curious what you think about uh, tonight's debate in general. What will be the high points for you? The high point for me will be the end, <laughs> because I'm totally dreading it. I don't like engaging in any activity where I don't see an upside, and I think uh, I think our boy uh, Mitt's been cleaning uh, Barack's clock. I just don't see an upside for it. All I see is potential downside. That's true. Yeah, hey, he's got something to lose. Obama's only got to win. Exactly. So... And you've got Bob Schieffer up there, and you know Bob's going to be, well, Bob Schieffer, sort of like an older, uglier Candy Crowley. <laughs> I think it's debatable which one's uglier, actually. Well, you know, Bob's got a way. <laughs> <clears throat> well, John, is, is, is Kurt right? Is this pretty much a, a bad, you know, he can't get out of it, clearly, but is this, a, is this a, something that Mitt's only got to lose? Well, when you look at how the election's going right now, it's probably he's probably just a little bit ahead, and he's got the momentum. We're down to what twelve days to go. Um, for him, the the biggest threat for him would be to make a big gaff tonight and slow his momentum. Assuming he doesn't, he's in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, I don't want to sound overconfident, but uh, I think if Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, one of those states goes his way, where he's got that locked down, this thing's over. So. He's in a good position right now. I think that he's got more to lose than Barack Obama tonight. Barack Obama has got to try to slow his momentum and get this thing going back in the other direction. Um, so, so, yeah, I'd agree with that generally. And also I'd add on China, just, just adding to what we're saying, uh, when you see the economic growth in that country, what's happening is you're having all these people who are being moved from subsistence farming out to the cities, and they're going out and they're making uh, widgets for a quarter an hour, or for a dollar an hour. So they're moving from basically nothing to actually producing something. That's driving the growth of their economy. But there's only so much of that you can do when you do have this overabundance of men there. This is a country that's historically been very unstable. I do agree that over time they're going to have some issues. I don't think you're going to see that economic growth continue forever. I think it's going to hit a wall. And when you do, you could see massive unrest in that country. So very possible. Let me ask uh, Colonel a question here because he's more in – Tuned with the military than the rest of us. One of the and topics, very relaxed and ready. <laughs> one of the topics tonight is the new face of terrorism, and I didn't know there was a new face of terrorism. Could do you have any What's insight? Like in that? What's that? It looks like the old face of terrorism to me. <laughs> I mean, has anything changed? Uh, they, some of them don't wear the same exact mask they wore before. I think that that might be something. The tea parties. Maybe it's the tea parties. <laughs> well, overall, what do you think tonight? Is is this something that Mitt is going to pull out and uh, you know and just finally dominate with, or or is uh, is it going to come out a draw and then it's irrelevant? God, I hope it's irrelevant. I I think that it's um, I think that that it's true that the the one who stands the most uh, to lose here is Mitt. The you could call the second one a draw. I mean, I, it was really it was a win depending on who you agree with, uh, which means it was a draw. The first one everybody agreed meant one. So if it's uh, one zero oh, and one, it seems like he's in a good position to have just said, you know what, that's enough debates. 
But obviously, that's not a choice. Um, as long as he just keeps, if, if he hammers him on Libya, but doesn't, I was so upset in the last debate because he didn't have to uh, have this moment hanging out there where um, Candy Crowley had decided to fact check in the middle of the debate and who cares if her facts were actually wrong and the transcript script wasn't there, etc. But he didn't, even at that point, have to do as poorly as he did at that moment. All he had to do was turn around and say, okay, great, you said terrorism the next day. Why didn't you say it again for the next two weeks? Why did you keep calling it a video after that? And if you did know, then what were we doing about it at that time? Because as far as we understood, you were calling them crazy protesters. So, you know, then what's your excuse if you knew it was a terrorist attack? Did you not know the day before? Why wasn't there more security there? There were, there were 100,000 ways that he could have handled uh, her coming back the way she did and, and saying that he did call it terrorism. Big deal. You can call it whatever you want. It's a question of what you do, and you didn't do jack. That's what he should have said. So my concern is going to be uh, that he, uh, I guess, deer in the headlights. That's what happened to him last week. He was doing really good, and then he had that moment. As long as he doesn't have another moment like that, I, I feel like he wins. Jimmy? Yeah, I, I, I don't want – what I don't want Mitt to do is I, I don't want him to play conservative. I don't want him to go up to the pool table and play a bunch of safeties. I don't want him to take the crazy trick shot – where he tries to hop the ball over eight balls in a wine glass and Barack Obama's forehead. But I don't want him to play safety all the time. What I want him to do is take the, take the really big openings that the president has given him. Hammer him on Syria. Hammer him on China. Um, hammer him. And, and if he gets a chance to throw a shot on Fast and Furious and 300 dead Mexicans, do that too. Aside from that, don't get fancy. I don't. I don't need Mitt to be fancy. He's not fancy. He shouldn't try. Well, he's fancy in a Monopoly man kind of way, but uh, <laughs> he's well dressed. But he's not. You know, he's not the he, guy. He you know, he's not tall. a pool shark. Right. <laughs> John, wrap it up. What do you think? I hope that Mitt Romney wins tonight. Goes on to win the election, so we can spend four years yelling at him. Yes. That's my goal, to try to keep him on a straight and narrow. And your thoughts, Kurt? Yeah, I, I've, got, I've got a second jot. I think that's a great take. Look, I, I, I'm concerned tonight because I don't see a the, the problem is you got the other side, including Schieffer, running interference for him. Uh, he's debating two guys, not one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I appreciate you all for being here, and uh, we'll be doing the post-debate afterwards. We usually run about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, you're all welcome to join me again, and uh, I'm going to go set up the live blog on Campaign Trail Report, and uh, I'll see you guys later, maybe. Thanks for being a part of this. Thank you. Thanks. See you later.